In this video, we will introduce a case study of parallel programming. We will calculate the pi value with the Monte Carlo method. So how to calculate pi? And what is the Monte Carlo method? The Monte Carlo method is a series of simulation methods that rely on random testing a large number of inputs. Since this is not a physics simulation course, we're not going to dive deep into Monte Carlo method. We'll only focus on this very simple example. In this example, we're going to generate a pair of random numbers between minus 1 and positive 1. We can use these two numbers to generate the coordinate of x and y, making them a point on the plane. We can calculate the distance between this point and the origin. If the distance is smaller than 1, it's within the unit circle. Since the numbers generated follows a uniform distribution, the point should also be uniformly distributed on the 2D plane. The ratio between the number of the points that fall in the unit circle and the total number of points should be the same of the ratio between the size of the circle and the plane. So that's expressed in the equation. n in, which is the number of points that fall in the circle, divided by n, which is the total number of the points, should equal to pi r squared divided by wh. We can see the pi here. Since the pi is unknown variable, Let's move it to the other side of the equation and bring in numbers. Now, we have pi equals 4n in divided by n. So with this equation, we can calculate pi by randomly generating a large number of points and counting how many of them fall in the circle. The more random number generated, the more accurate pi we can calculate. Okay, if you understand this process, it should not be too hard for you to write a regular program in C. But how can we convert algorithm into a parallel implementation? In the rest of the video, we can try to generalize the method that converts the serial implementation into parallel implementation. First, let's look at the single thread implementation written in pseudocode. We first define two counters and initialize them to zero. Then, we write a for loop to generate a point in each iteration. In the loop, we generate the x and the y coordinates as random numbers from minus 1 to 1. We then calculate the distance. If the distance is less than 1, we increment the in count. Otherwise, we increment the out count. To start converting it to a parallel implementation, we first need to identify the loops. In this example, we only have one loop. But in more complex examples, we may have multiple loops either nested or not. The general idea is to execute the iteration in parallel. To achieve parallel iteration execution, we need to analyze the loop to check if the iterations can be executed in parallel. We need to find the iteration local variables and operations. In this example, the x, y, and the dist variable are independent from iteration to iteration. Each iteration assigns them with new values. The operations that generate random numbers, calculate the distance, and compare the distance with 1 are also iteration independent. Meanwhile, we have cross iteration variables and operations. For example, the in count and out count counters need to take the output from the previous iteration as the input of the current iteration. For iteration local variables, we can simply use a thread to process one or more iterations. Since there are no dependencies between the iterations, we do not need to worry about race conditions. However, for cross-iteration operations, we either need to use atomic or mutexes to protect the data, serialize the execution, or create some other methods. We do not want to use atomic, mutexes, or serialize the methods because they will reduce performance. In general, we want to minimize the part in which we serialize the execution. That is enough analysis. Let's come back to code. Here we have a serial implementation of the pseudocode introduced previously. This function takes the argument n, representing the number of points to generate. It uses the variable pi to serve as the counter that counts the number of points inside a circle. When calculating the distance, we do not really need to get the square root since we only care if the distance is greater than 1 or not. Now, let's convert this program to a parallel implementation step by step. 
The first step is to create a struct that contains the information to pass to the thread. Here, we include two pieces of information. The n here is the number of points to generate in the thread. The pi contains the calculated pi value. It is an output argument. Next, we consider what the thread function looks like. It is very simple. We can simply cast the argument type to call the zero version of the implementation. Keep in mind that multiple copies of the zero function are supposed to be executing in parallel. Each thread calculates its own pi value by generating random numbers. Next, let's see how to implement the main program. In the main program, we first define the number of threads to create. We set it to 4 initially, but we will see how the number of threads impacts performance in the next video. Next, we define some variables, including the threads and the arguments. The most important part of the program is to use a loop to create threads. The threads will equally share the total amount of points to generate. After all the threads are started, we use another loop to wait for all the threads to complete execution. In this loop, we call pthreadjoin API. Although we cannot ensure the order that the threads terminate, the loop will guarantee that all the threads complete execution. Finally, we need to aggregate the pi value calculated by each thread. We simply average the value. Now we have completed the parallel implementation. To summarize the process, we consider the process of converting a serial program to a parallel implementation includes five steps. First, we implement the program in a serial version. Do not skip this step, as the serial implementation guarantees that you understand the algorithm. Later on, you will use this serial implementation to verify the parallel program execution results. Next, we identify loops, especially for loops. For loops are easier than while loops because we know how many iterations to run beforehand. Then, we need to look deeper into the loop to identify the part that is iteration independent. We can easily convert the iteration independent parts into threads, but we need to develop a new solution to aggregate the results from each thread to complete the cross iteration operations.